and apart from the Lord Jesus, he will be the most brilliant man that ever lived. He will be absolutely a wonderful man. This man will be personified by the devil. And those of you who know anything about Europe, especially Western Europe, will know that the whole of Western Europe is ready for that man. And then he's going to have a close associate called the false prophet. And he will do outstanding miracles. And behind these dual men there will be the sinister power of the devil. In fact, they will be possessed of him. At that time, many people will succumb to his influence and they will wear on their forehead his number 666, the number of man. Some will wear the number on their hands and you won't be able to buy or sell until you have that number. At the same time, there will be 144 Jewish people who will realize that they put Christ on the cross, their Messiah, and they will repent. And they will be God's evangelists in that time of the day of the Lord. And they will go all over the world saying, the king is coming, and he will come within a period of seven years. Then God's judgments will begin. First of all, there are the seal judgments. Then there are these awful trumpet judgments. And then there are these bold judgments, when if those judgments did not cease, the whole world would be exterminated. Why will there be judgment? Because of the abounding iniquity that will be in the world. We see it now, but what will it be like when God's sort and light company is removed? The church of God. It will come in like a flood. And we are being prepared for that right now. Now, when the end comes there will be a complete turnover of this world. He will shake it and shake it and shake it. As I said a few moments ago, if he didn't shorten that period, all flesh would perish. But that judgment will prepare the world also for the great millennial reign. So that when he comes to reign, the world will be brought back, or perhaps I should say the earth will be brought back to its original glory. And he will reign for a thousand years, and for the first time ever, the world will have a utopia. It will be a wonderful period. And then at the end of that period, Satan will be let loose. Why? there be millions of children that will be born in that period who were not born again. Wonderful period, but not born again. And then he will deceive the nations again. And God then will destroy the present heavens and the earth. And he will build a new heaven and a new earth and we shall see the glory of heaven coming right down to us. It's called the eternal state. Right at the end of the great period of the millennium, there will be this great white throne, and I want you to see it tonight. It will be erected somewhere in the mystical space. And you will notice now that it is a great white throne. It will be the greatest judgment of all apart from one thing. 
when the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, died on a Roman gibbet, he died before God. And in those three hours of darkness, from the sixth to the ninth hour, the darkness of hell covered the earth. And in that darkness, the Lord God took the equation of the sin of the world and laid it on Christ. With all its corresponding judgment. Now let's clear, get this clear. It doesn't mean to say that God was angry with the Son. He felt all the sorrow as much as the Son. But the whole Trinity was engaged in this great work of bringing man to God. And when he was on that cross, he bore our sins and all its corresponding judgment. That's why with a loud voice he said, My God, my God, why didst thou forsake me? All the sufferings were then over. Then with a mighty voice he said, finished, and the work was done. And therefore all the preachers for over 2,000 years have been preaching that moment. And Paul put it beautifully, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight God wants to draw you with his mercy. But there will come a day when he will judge the world and the nations. It's a great throne. Apart from Calvary, it's the greatest judgment of all. No judgment like it. I know there was a judgment in the antediluvian age when only Noah and his family were saved. I know that judgment fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah and as we go through the scriptures we see the various judgments but this is the greatest. All see that word great. Then you will notice another word white. Now quite frankly there's no word in any language that describes that word white. We have a whiteness, but in comparison with that whiteness, it would be a cream. You see, now we are looking at the person on the throne and we see his dazzling glory. Now just imagine standing there with your sins in the midst of that dazzling glory. How would you feel? Then you will notice it's a throne. Now why? Now I must make this clear in a nice way to you. When you become a Christian, you just don't accept Jesus. This is what the word says. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Notice it goes on. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Someone said to me the other day, I want to be saved, but I want to continue with my sin. You can't do it. Can't do it. No. When you become a Christian, you make him Saviour and Lord. And may I say this, he's a wonderful master. I've been serving him for 74 years, 75 years, and he's a wonderful master. I've let him down many times, but he's never let me down. He's a wonderful Lord to serve. But now we notice it's a throne. What does it mean? Every single person that's ever been born into this world will stand there if they've rejected Christ. 
and they will stand before the great white throne. Tonight, God has provided a mercy seat. It's wonderful. And that mercy seat is called by a long word, the propitiation. What does it mean? Here in his love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. It's a mercy seat. It's a place where we can come to the Lord Jesus and his longing for us to come. I can almost hear him saying tonight, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he's calling people. But there are thousands and millions of people who have never come, and they don't want to come. In that day, they will come. And everyone will give an account of himself to God. You know, dear friends, just after the war, King George VI made an amnesty for all deserters. And I was having a mission in a place called Madison, and I went to the local police station. I said, how many people have come and declared themselves? And this is what he said. There are 350 deserters in Stirlingshire, but only eight have come. Can I tell you something that's far worse? The Lord Jesus has provided an amnesty through his blood, and how many have come and received that forgiveness? But in that day, they will come. Now I want you to note the judge. Now this is interesting. We don't read about his feet like we do in the first chapter. We don't read about his hands. There's only one part of the body that we read of, and that's his face. What does that mean? It means two things. He is identified. The same lovely face that was marred more than any man when he died. The same face that they spat upon. That denotes the identity of his love when he said, Father, forgive them, is now on the throne. But the face is not marred. The faith is that of a king. And then in the first chapter of the Revelation we find this. His eyes are the eyes of fire. They penetrate right through us. That's why there's no solicitor. There's no defending barrister. There's no jury. They're not needed. The moment you stand before him, you will be like an open book. The eyes of fire will see through you. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus was speaking to a Samaritan woman? And she was speaking about worship as though she was very religious. He quietly said, go and call your husband. Oh, she says, I have no husband. He says, thou hast said no husband, thou hast had five husbands. Uh, he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. He saw through her. Friends, I can't see through you. Thank God I can't. But he sees through you tonight. And in that day, all that stand before that judge will be seen through and there be no hiding. And then another thing that we find, before his face, and this is so great, I can't fully explain it, the earth and the heaven 
slid away. Think of it. You see, he created our earth by commands. And those commands released energy. And that energy created matter. And when it comes to the creation of man, it was individual. He didn't create man by commands. Just like a potter forming a clay pot, he formed man from the dust of the earth. Why? Man was his masterpiece. And now he's the creator. And all of a sudden, the heavens and the earth flee away and you stand before him, the power of the Lord. And then the face is also the place of intimate identification. Now, can I say something that's very serious? On some nights, the Lord has been in this tent in mighty power. And I've seen him coming to people through the power of the Spirit. And he's been saying to scores, I am the door. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And I've watched some of my dear friends whom I love go out without Christ, without God, when his coming is almost nearer. In that day they'll see his face. They remember the knock when he wanted to come in and they rejected him. Thank God in the tent all this fortnight he hasn't been here as a judge. He's been here as a loving saviour. And the scripture says he is able to say fully and completely all that come unto God by him. The scripture says he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. The scripture says in the Old Testament he's mighty to save. There's no one too bad that he can't save. But only a few have been saved. Don't neglect him tonight, else you'll meet him as a judge. Now the judgment. This is so serious, I know not how to explain it to you. Now I shall never be completely a hellfire preacher. I preach it because it's there and the fact. When I preach on hell, I don't sleep almost for two nights. Do you know, sometimes I walk the floor because of the horror of a lost eternity. And here we find the Lord Jesus as a judge. And this is what we find. The books are open. Now grip this. He doesn't need books. Why? He's omniscient. That means he knows. He never thinks. But we need the books to understand. And the first book that's opened, I'm going to suggest very clearly, are the book of sins. And you will see your sins not as you know, but as God knows. Remember, the thought of foolishness is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We were learning the other night that the average Englishman violates the Ten Commandments no less than a million times over a period of 30 years. They'll be all recorded. But he will record the sins that he knows. And you won't be able to excuse yourself. Why? Because the judge has the eyes of fire. 
And then you will realize, because of his whiteness, that you cannot go into heaven. What a terrible thing it would be to see in heaven an act of lust, or a lie, or an act of bad temper. Naught that defiles shall ever enter in. That's why it's going to be an indescribable, wonderful place. But there at the great white throne, the books will be opened, the eyes of fire will see through you, and you will realize that you've died in your sin. That will be a tragedy. But more. The book of opportunity. You say, where do you get that from, Peter? The Lord Jesus said, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for Capernaum. For if they saw the mighty works that Capernaum had seen, they would have repented long ago. Now, I must say something that's terribly serious, and I must not raise my voice. I trust I shall put all the love I can in this. Did you know Northern Ireland was the most privileged place in the world? Did you know that? There's more gospel preached in Northern Ireland in, than in any place in the world. And it's lovely. I go through the streets, I look at the trees and there are gospel scriptures on the trees. Wonderful. Many of the ministers, they preach the gospel clearly. Wonderful. But there's a responsibility. Dear friends, can I say this to you right from my heart? If you die without being born again, you're not only being hell, but you'll probably be in the lowest part of hell because you had all the privileges and you rejected them. I do not know, I cannot tell, but I believe there are young people who have been brought up in Christian homes and they're determined to reject Christ. Your place in hell will be very deep. I believe there are people here tonight and you've heard a minister of God preaching and you heard it week after week and you said, I don't want to hear it anymore. <sighs> Your judgment will be in the lowest part of hell. That's why tonight you would be very foolish to go out of this tent without Christ. And then one book is opened. It's called the Book of Life. That means the book of born again people. That's why I preached it last night. When you are born again, God forgives your sins once and forever because of the once and for all sacrifice. And that forgiveness is so complete, so final, that he can put within you the Holy Spirit and you are born again. <coughs> but this is the tragedy. There are thousands of people in my own country that go to church every week and they're not born again. What a shock! When the book is opened, the book of born-again people and their names are not there. Now we never throw stones at religion. We never throw stones at good works. But we want to say this, and may I say it abruptly, are you born again? Has Christ come right into your life and transformed you? Or have you got just a second-hand religion? In this day, for you, it will be an awful tragedy. 
Can't you almost see the book being opened and the omission of your name and the judge shaking his head saying, no admittance, no admittance, and that will be eternal. Do you know, here tonight, there is the Holy Spirit. We were praying for it, and hallelujah, he's come. And he's moving through this tent. I don't have to preach much more. The Lord is coming to you and warning you. He loves you. He died for you. He wants to save you. He wants to give you the new birth. But there's one more thing. Because we are living in such superficial days and because the gospel is not being preached finally and completely, many people make a profession. But they're not born again. And it will be a tragedy for them. You can almost hear sayings, hear them saying, but Lord, I've taken the communion every Sunday. I sit at the Lord's table. I've taught in the Sunday school. Your name's omitted. Make sure you haven't got a second-hand faith. Make sure tonight you were born again. You may not remember the day or the moment, but you will know if you have been born again. And I'm saying all this in love to you. I don't want anyone here tonight to stand before the great white throne in judgment. Now what will be the judgment? I find it very hard to speak about these things. You will die... In your sins. And you know what that means. Under judgment, you will sin for eternity. Him that's filthy, let him be filthy too. And just imagine having a body of damnation, for that's what it's called, and you have the propensity, and you will sin forever <laughs> under the awful judgment of God. Secondly, it's called outer darkness. Now why? Before you are born again, there is inward darkness within you because of sin. When you are at the great white throne and you move into the lake of fire, the inward becomes outward. And that means you'll never have light. When you become a Christian, you walk in the light. That means you walk in the presence of God. You'll never have that in hell. Inward darkness becomes outward darkness forever. But more. If you're not born again, irrespective of your religiousness, and I'm not throwing stones at religion, you are separated from God. That's why they had to learn this in the Old Testament. Even when the priest came into the holy place, there was a curtain, and they were prohibited from going into the holiest of all. Why? Because that curtain, in one aspect, related that there was a barrier between man and God. There be no evangelist in hell crying out, be reconciled to God. It's eternal separation from God. And then lastly, in hell, you will never find a born-again Christian. 
all thought and light will go. But you will see demons as profuse as human beings. And you will see Satan himself under judgment. And then it will dawn upon you, I've been totally and completely deceived and I'm lost forever. And there shall be weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth for a long eternity. Dear friends, it's not the will of God that you should be in hell. When he died on the cross, he died for all mankind. And that same heart of love is there within him. And his longing to save you tonight. Now some people are saved when the preaching of sin is preached in the power of the Spirit. Some people are saved when the preaching of the cross comes to them and they're broken. But a few are saved because of the preaching of hell. There is a hell. There is a great white throne. And you need to be saved. I told you last night, or the other night, I had a serious operation. And after that operation, I needed four pints of blood. And I shall never forget the moment when they injected that blood in me. It was saving me physically. I left and I thanked the surgeon and I thanked all the nurses for their kindness and would you believe it, the man that came and slept on my bed had strong religious convictions. He had the same problem as I had and he needed four pints of blood but he wouldn't receive it. The surgeon came to him twice and pleaded with him to take the blood. He said no. Two or three of the nurses argued with him. One said this, there was a man in this bed as religious as you are and he took the blood and he's been saved from death. Why don't you do it? No. And that brilliant surgeon came to, for the last time, this was all in the national papers, and brought all the apparatus to save his life by his bed. And then he got down with tears and pleaded with him to take the blood. He said no. And ten people sat around that bed and they watched him die. Rejecting the blood. Don't do that. I've brought all the apparatus of forgiveness by your side tonight. Can I say it and close? The Lord loves you. He died for you. Oh, he wants to forgive you. He comes over and over again to you. But if you totally reject him, there's only one end. The lake of fire. May God help many to call on the name of the Lord now. Shall we pray?